good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you happen to be around the world. And welcome to the fourth session of our conference on constitutions and democratic transition in the Arab region. As you know, this is the ninth uh, uh, annual conference on the subject of transitions, uh, which uh, basically means that ever since the start of the Arab Spring, these events have been happening and they bring together tens of Arab scholars and uh, uh, also uh, international experts to debate and discuss various aspects related to the political and socio-economic uh, transition in the Arab region. Uh, today, our session will focus on some lessons learned from international experts. And I'm uh, uh, very pleased to host three uh, very eminent uh, specialist in the subject, uh, academics and practitioners to give us their, uh, their feedback and their ideas on the making and or writing of constitutions and the way it pro progresses uh, throughout uh, a transition. My name is uh, Sultan Barakat and I am the director of the Center for Conflict and Humanitarian Studies here in Doha and a professor at the Doha Institute. For our discussion, we have uh, uh, Nathan uh, Brown and uh, Marcos uh, Birkenford and William Elliott Balmer. I will be introducing each of them uh, uh, in more detail as I ask them to speak. But broadly speaking, the way we plan this session is Nathan is going to start with a historical view, looking at the Arab region and maybe exploring over the last century or so, has constitution making really changed or is it just a perception that we have? After that, we have uh, Marcos who will be presenting his, uh, uh, based on his uh, experience, uh, exploring more detail the crafting of uh, constitutions and to what extent they, uh, there are uh, specific challenges and we're very pleased that Marcus has experience in uh, almost uh, a dozen countries uh, of constitution making, and many of them will be related to our experiences in the Arab world. And then we're going to go into some comparative uh, uh, discussion of various constitution uh, writing by uh, Professor Belmer, who will be uh, in particular raising some of the dilemmas faced by experts when uh, engaging in issues of constitution making. Uh, for this session, we have an hour and a half altogether, and the plan is to allow each of our speakers to speak for a maximum of 20 minutes, and I ask kindly that you try and stick to that so that we allow our audience to engage with us uh, in the last half an hour of the session. And I'm really pleased to say that we have more than 400 uh, people at the moment listening, following the discussion, which means that uh, we have to be extremely selective in, in how many questions we can take. And uh, it would be great if we can allow them the time to ask the questions. For the audience who are following us, the way to ask a question is basically to write down in the uh, chat box. Uh, and uh, our colleagues here will uh, somehow uh, make those questions available to me and I will address them to the speakers. So uh, without further ado, if uh, I can introduce our first speaker, uh, Mr. Nathan Brown. Nathan Brown received his BA in political science from the University of Chicago and MA PhD in politics and Near Eastern studies from Princeton University. He teaches courses on Middle Eastern politics as well as general courses on comparative politics. He's known as the man who was the president of the Middle East Studies Association and played a very important role during that uh, tenure. And uh, he is also uh, the recipient of many awards. I will not mention all of them because there's a long list of those awards. What I'd like to emphasize is that Nathan has received uh, uh, quite uh, important grants to undertake his work uh, from the United States Peace uh, Institute and the Fulbright uh, Fellowship. He is now an unresident fellow of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and has acted as an advisor to the committee that drafted the Palestinian constitution 
And I suspect maybe that will also be reflected in his presentation. So uh, please, Nathan, if you can start with your 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, um, Sultan. I should actually thank all the organizers of, of this conference. It's quite a task to bring off something that has 400 participants. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody by name, but that would take up the entire 20 minutes. Um, and I'd also, but I'd also like to thank all the participants. Um, it's a challenge to uh, 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 be able to uh, participate remotely in, in this kind of way. So it's gratifying to see so much interest in the topic. What I want to uh, address is a question uh, uh, Professor Barakat, the chairman of the session, um, um, mentioned, and that is, has constitution making change in the Arab world? Or seen differently, is this a new kind of constitutional moment, the current moment when there's a tremendous interest in writing constitutional texts as part of political transitions? Is, is it really a departure point? And my answer in short is yes, but that's mixed news. The current moment, I think, and by the current moment, I mean probably the last decade, maybe two decades or so, is more realistic and more engaged uh, in terms of constitution writing, but it's also much clearer what the difficulties of writing constitutions will be, uh, how much of a challenge it is uh, to write constitutions that will provide for some kind of, of, of democratic future for the Arab world. And in essence, I think the focus in writing constitutions has moved, and this is a process I want to trace, from focusing on text to focusing on process, and, but it is now beginning to focus on politics, and I'll explain what that means. Uh, so if, if, if I look at the past actually century and a half, you would have to go back to the second half of the 19th century to see, understand the beginning of the era experience with drafting constitutions, you see earlier generations, uh, several earlier generations, focusing primarily on constitutional text. These were often documents that were drafted by people with legal training, and they were generally by members of the state apparatus, sometimes very high up in the regime. If you look at the earliest efforts, for instance, in Tunisia, or Egypt, um, or neighboring efforts, the Ottoman Empire, what they often were, were very high state officials who were confronting all kinds of challenges, fiscal crisis, uh, international crisis, the pressure of European imperialism. And they tried to design constitutional text that would enable the state to, in, to, to, to uh, face these fiscal and international challenges. And of course, the problem was by focusing so much on mechanisms within the state, a lot of the people who were behind these efforts didn't necessarily have a strong social constituency. There wasn't a strong political drive beyond beyond the political elite be behind this. And those efforts often came up short. As time went on, we move into the 20th century, again, you see a focus on writing texts, texts that guaranteed sovereignty, perhaps, texts that fixed relations among the political elite. But, but through most of the first half of the, of, of the 20th century, there was a great emphasis on what the Constitution said on, on, the, on the text, and much less on how it was, uh, was being written. And so what you had as a result was a series of constitutional texts governing the Arab world, I would say, into the last quarter of the 20th century, perhaps even beyond that that tended to be the state or the regime talking to itself or talking to its population. The constitutions uh, were ones that reflected um, the desires of existing regimes to govern more effectively, but weren't necessarily part of, of, of broad processes. Um, and so you had constitutional texts that didn't necessarily change an awful lot over time. I'm sorry I actually missed uh, uh, Tom Ginsburg's presentation because of a prior commitment, but I think one thing that he's done in some interesting comparative work has shown that um, the uh, often the best, if you, if you want to know what a country's constitution is going to say, you can pay very, very close attention to the current politics, but often the best place to look was what was in the old constitution, what was in the constitution that that it, that, that is just being uh, superseded. If I look, for instance, at Egyptian constitution since 1971, you see tremendous political change. But if you didn't know anything about that change and you just read the 1971 constitution, the amendments to it, the 2012 constitution, the 2014 constitution and the amendments to it, you would be struck by how much these texts resemble each other, that 95% of the content just doesn't change or there's minor rearrangement. So if you want to understand what's going on, 
you you cannot simply look at text. If you have to have a a, 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 a broader view, and and in in a sense, that's what I think constitutional architects have realized that you have to focus not simply on what the text says, but on the process by which it was written. This was already becoming clear, I think, in the second half of the 20th century. If I look, for instance, at one constitution that has been particularly long lived and that has had a viable life beyond its sort of paper life, um, the standout exception in much of the Arab world in the 20th century was the Kuwaiti constitution. And it was written essentially as part of a politically pluralistic process between a, a, a ruling family and a host of Kuwaiti social actors, political actors that essentially came together to be able to draft a constitution that certainly went through some rough periods, but is still there today in unamended form. And still, even if we talk about the events of the past week, still showing some remarkable vitality, partly because I think not, to, not, not of the constitutional text itself, simply be, but because of the process by which it was written, a much more inclusive process. Palestinian basic law, Professor Barakat mentioned, you know, the Palestinian experience. It has not been a happy one, I would say, but again, what you do see is one promising element, and that is that the Palestinian basic law went from being grouped drafted by a narrow group of technical experts advising the Palestine National Council to being in the late 1990s actually a broad participatory and inclusive effort. And so it took on a little uh, different di uh, uh, different life. The Iraqi constitution after 2003 was again, there was at least an effort to try and, 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 and be broader in the composition. And then of course, since 2011, it has become uh, uh, very much part of the political agenda in many Arab societies, an insistence on a more public and inclusive uh, constitutional process. So in a sense, if we are at a new moment, the new moment is not so much on what constitutions are supposed to say, but on how they are supposed to be written in a public and inclusive process. And let me just take a moment to say, I've been, I've, I've used public and inclusive as if this, the are synonyms as if these are the same things. In my mind, they're actually very different things. And the recent Arab experience show, uh, bears this out. If you talk about public, what you mean is the constitution is, is, is written in full public view. There's widespread public debate, widespread public discussion, and so on. And that tends to have certain effects. What it tends to do, I think, is to emphasize what I would call the identity portions or the symbolic portions of constitutions. A lot of public debate focuses, for instance, on, on relations between religion and state. How is the state going to be identified? It focuses on preambles or on the early articles. Um, you know, the, A lot of the debate in Tunisia focused on really the first couple articles of the constitution, what they were going to say. A lot of the debate in Egypt has been about Article 2, which defines the relationship between the Islamic Sharia and 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 and, and legislation and, and the state. So public constitution drafting tends to emphasize those elements in ways that sometimes magnifies political conflicts, but at least puts them out to the open. Participatory or inclusive constitution drafting means that you've got a wide variety of political forces at the table. And when that happens, yes, they sometimes look at symbolic language, but they also tend to focus very much on very practical elements. Who gets the uh, uh, ability to, to do what? Um, I, if if you, I'm a politician trying to help draft a constitution and decide, for instance, on what is a, what are the par powers of the parliament? One of the first questions I will ask myself is, how many seats is my party going to likely to get in the next parliamentary elections? Are we likely to control the presidency or not? That will affect a lot of my views about executive legislative functions and so forth and so on. So when you get participatory constitution drafting, rather than it this being seen as sort of a technical effort done by lawyers, it's politicians trying to come together for to forge an agreement on the basic rules of the political game. And, and, um, and I would say the international community of, inter of, of constitutional experts has followed this path of focusing much more, I think, right now on, on, on process, on how constitutions can be written in public and or participatory processes, um, that's an awful lot of the of, of where international expertise has invested its, its attention. But what that can sometimes miss is that the process itself is political.
right? We sometimes tend to think of constitutional moments as ones in which uh, they're pre-political moments. They're, they're moments at which political contestation stops, societies sit down and think, what are the fundamental rules of the political game? They write them down and then they move forward with, with politics. But of course, politics never stops. Right. The, 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 the actors in the constitutional drama or the players in the constitutional game generally know very well what the implications of certain procedural choices are. If you look, for instance, at constitutional politics in Egypt between 2011 and 2014, as I said, the constitutional text didn't actually change that much. There were some, there were some significant differences, but the really bitter conflicts were about who was supposed to write this document and how. There were really, an awful lot of them were procedural questions because people realized, all the political players realized that whoever is doing the drafting has an awful lot of say. And if you if you write it, if, if for instance, um, in a, uh, a uh, in, in this kind of process, you're likely to get this result in a dip, that kind of process. You know, you had this tremendous debate almost immediately after the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. He, uh, um, within a month, when does constitution writing come as part of a sequence of a, of, of, a, of a transition? Does it come before or after parliamentary elections, presidential elections, and so on? This was not just an abstract graduate seminar, this was a bitter political struggle where people realized if we do it this way, for instance, if the, the earlier we have elections, the, the, the likelier the Islamists are going to do well. And that deeply informed the way that, 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 that people came to the table with procedural demands about how the constitution was going to be written. So, so the procedure is political, the decisions about how to make it are political. And I would say a lot of the problems that the Arab societies have encountered in the last 10 years or so is in coming to some kind of procedural agreement. And the problem is that there's an imbalance of political forces. Some, ex some political forces have what I would call an exit option. That's certainly what happened in Iraq when the, the process that um, essentially was, was designed in part by some Iraqi political actors, but also by American political actors who had completely different concerns, irrelevant to Iraq, more having to do with the electoral cycle in the United States. It made them want to move in a hurry. Um, well, the Iraqi actors who did not want to participate with it, in, in this exited. They exited the constitutional process, and Iraq saw a constitutional process that essentially accompanied and probably accelerated the drift towards civil war, what was essentially a period of, 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 of civil war. Um, so in, in, in Egypt, you basically had a situation in which those people who didn't like the constitutional result, the constitutional processes, um, essentially tried to over, over, overturn the process. So part of the problem is that this political process of, or this political question of how to write a constitution is one in which, which encounters this severe political problem of imbalance of forces, of an exit option, um, and, and, and uh, so on. It's one reason, for instance, why I think if, 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 if again, Professor Barakat made reference to the uh, uh, a Palestinian effort right now, in a sense, there are two Palestinian processes going on as we speak. There's a drafting committee of experts that's operating right now in, in, in the West Bank that has been on and off again, really, over the last, uh, uh, in many ways, over the last quarter century, that's kind of quietly working that way. And there are reconciliation talks in Istanbul among the factions. Those both have to be linked in some way for you to have a successful process. And that's going to be very, very hard to do. So I think the good news, uh, going back to the question, is is there a new constitutional moment? The good news is I think there is a very powerful realization in many Arab societies that the fundamental political questions need management and need to be addressed. They're not outside of the constitutional process. They are inside it. But, but I, I, I don't see a magical answer. I don't see a magical answer, for instance, in the Palestinian case. I don't see a magical answer in, 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 in the Egyptian case, where you have, in essence, a series of, of constitutional documents that 
as I said, the process of, of, of writing them sometimes magnify political divisions rather than help people uh, 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 manage, manage them. Um, and so you have a very difficult political moment, one in which uh, I think constitution writing becomes much harder because the current drafters are really grappling with the essence of constitution writing. That's good news, it's more realism, but it makes the process harder. And uh, finally, um, let me, let me uh, include my, my remarks with uh, another sober but realistic uh, comment, is that a, a sound constitution needs political pluralism and grappling with the politically pluralistic environment in order to come to successful conclusion, but it's not a magic solution. Um, a constitution, a sound constitution that operates in a non-pluralistic environment is one that um, I think is going to be more problematic than an unsound constitution that operates in a pluralistic environment. Um, and here I'm going to talk about events, I think, very close to my own home, quite literally, since I live in, in, in Washington, D.C. In all kinds of ways, I think, um, this is, we're focusing here on the Arab world, but in all kinds of ways, I think the, the United States Constitution is a deeply flawed document, but it has worked to the extent that it has because of a viable pluralistic environment. Right now, the constitutional crisis in the United States comes, I think, with threats to that pluralistic environment. And, and so the kind of constitutional crisis that the United States is maybe going through is, is a, should be a cautionary note that even if you, whether or not you get the constitution right, uh, you still need healthy politics, a, a pluralism and an acceptance of a, uh, of a plurality of political forces for even uh, a good constitution to operate soundly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natan. Can, sorry. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for sticking to the time. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's been it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, as you know, uh, here in uh, Doha, at the moment, uh, uh, Doha is hosting the Afghan uh, peace talks between Taliban and the Republic. And the constitution is, uh, is very much at the center of this. And I think the message you, you brought to all of us about the importance of focusing on the process and not just the text and the process in the could lead to uh, opportunities is very, very important. Uh, thank you very much. We'll come back to you later with further questions. And I just want to remind our uh, audience, please, there are two types of audience. I was, it was pointed out to me just, just a minute ago. There are those who are panelists and have been, access, uh, been given access as panelists, and there are about 30 to 40 of those. If you have any question, please, you can use the function where you raise your hand and those who are following us, the uh, greater mass of followers on uh, social media, you uh, simply need to write your question in the uh, chat box of, uh, for questions and answers. Thank you very much. With that, we'll move on to our uh, second speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Marcus Ochenford. I don't know, Marcus, if I spelled your name, if I pronounced it correctly. Uh, Marcus uh, is an associate professor of comparative constitutional law at the Center European University. And before that, he came from an extensive practical experience, both with the uh, German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and the German equivalent of the Foreign Office. Uh, very importantly, Marcus was uh, an officer at the International Idea in Stock Stockholm, Sweden who specializes uh, quite a bit in institution uh, uh, write in constitution writing. And he is a co-author of the uh, well-used practical guide to constitution building published by International Ideas. Uh, we're very much looking forward to hearing uh, Marcus's uh, uh, remarks, which will focus on the issue of the president and the constitution and in particular in North Africa, the recent attempts to uh, limit or constrain the powers of uh, president in the constitution. 
Uh, Marcus, the floor is yours. Salam alaikum. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed for the inter invitation and for the possibility to discuss and share some thoughts. Um, actually, when I provided the title uh, some weeks or even months ago, when I was asked to present, I shared this title. Now, having seen the program, this great, magnificent program and the other speakers on this panel, uh, though I don't change the content, but I might change the approach. So from the rule of law slash amendment law to do immutable clauses, eternity clauses help. And um, actually I will present um, or address three parts. Uh, first, the third wave of democratization and the mushrooming, mushrooming of term limits in Africa. Then, um, why immutable clauses had been introduced to better protect term limits and how eternal is eternity, whether those immutable clauses made a difference at all. Whenever it is possible, I will make a small excursus uh, to the Arab world, so not limiting on the eight countries uh, that are uh, part of the Arab League and situated in, in Africa, but, but going beyond. So, the third wave of democratization in the early 90s uh, really uh, led to the writing of new constitutions, and most constitutions included term limit provisions. So, term limit provisions are some easier parts to include in a constitution when it's drafted because they only became relevant, or the litmus test is only shortly before the end of the second or whatsoever the last term uh, of the, the president. Then it is tested, and so it's easy to include it, uh, and what happens afterwards uh, will be seen, and actually, sorry, And what we can see here, and this is not an um, exclusive list, there are many more trends, but uh, whenever those uh, last term came to an end, many presidents uh, in Africa uh, wanted to amend and actually did amend those terms. Now, with Tom Ginsburg, um, we, we really might to ask what what's about with constitutional amendments? Because most constitutions provide for the opportunity to amend uh, provisions. And actually, African constitutions uh, do have even a variety of uh, requirements that need to be met in order to amend the constitution. Now, uh, with Tom Ginsburg, we have to ask ourselves whether the provision on term limits is rather a default rule or a strict imposition. What does he mean or do I mean by default rule? So is it rather that we acknowledge that once you have an incumbent in place, that incumbent enjoys many advantages. So it might, get, might be easier for him getting re-elected. So that means that after his uh, second term or his, his last term, in order to continue to be re-elected, he or she has to overcome the extra burden of amending the constitution. And once he managed to reach the required majority, this is part of the ordinary process. So it's a stumbling block uh, after two terms, that needs to be overcome, that there's nothing moral um, bad or, or nothing to criticize if he's trying to do so. Or other option, it's really a core instrument. It's, it's a, a central structure of a constitution and a proponent for constitutionalism. So why I'm addressing this 
because uh, when one reads this kind of constitutional pathos, like here is a quote from Rwanda, while our constitution is not wholly writ, it's a monument, it's immutable in principle. So then as a constitutional engineer, you have the opportunity to translate those pathos into a at least formal legal uh, reality. And actually, if we look at the results of the Afrobarometer, we see that the people at least, they want to have term limits as an imposition. They do not want to have it just as a stumbling block, but they are uh, throughout most countries uh, straight and clear. So now what option constitutionally one has to uh, further entrench uh, constitutional provisions, including term limits. Burundi opted for an extremely high threshold for constitutional amendments in general. And it's worth noting that the former president of Burundi in all his different strategies and attempt to remain in office, he also tried to amend the constitution in the ordinary way, but he failed to reach the 80% threshold. So at that stage, uh, the, the Burundian constitution was still viable with regard to term limits. So, so why he could stay on in office, uh, that had been other techniques and practices. Another country, Ghana, uh, involves uh, a referendum but has extremely high percentage on uh, the uh, voter turnout. So you need to have at least half of the citizen to participate and then a 75 approval. So extremely high threshold. A completely different way was chosen by uh, Liberia and then followed by, by Zimbabwe that are not saying you cannot amend term limit provisions, but they won't count for you. So if you as a president try to amend the constitution to stay in power, it won't work. And well, the only test this approach uh, had to overcome, it worked in Liberia. Uh, now, if you think, well, those are all high thresholds, but isn't it the strongest threshold to render the presidential term limit clause immutable. Just to say, well, you never can amend it or um, um, get rid of it, regardless of the majorities you, you, you might gain. And actually, let us be aware that this immutable clauses or eternity clauses, at least in Africa, are a reflection of colonial heritage. because um, the countries with a civil law background, all of them do have immutable clauses. The only exception I found was Mozambique. But otherwise, whether it's Lusophone, whether it's Francophone, whether it's Libya, um, all countries with a kind of more civil law uh, affinity do have uh, immutable clauses, while uh, with the exception of Namibia, and here we can discuss to what extent Namibia isn't rather a kind of mixed uh, system, with the exception of uh, Namibia, none of the common law background countries do have substantive immutable clauses. I mean, they have some amnesty provisions for former military persons that cannot be taken away, but substance-wise, uh, no uh, immutable clauses. Again, here it depends where you situate Egypt. I thought Egypt is not a kind of common law background. Uh, and unfortunately, just this week, uh, Gambia or the, the, the relevant assembly didn't pass the, the draft of the Gambian constitution. So that would have been the first one uh, uh, or another common law country that introduces term limits. So 
just be aware that this also has to do with some legal culture. Probably this idea of parliamentary sovereignty uh, creates some specific challenges in going along with the concept of eternity clauses. So now just to share uh, the figures within the Arab world, so the members of the Arab League, actually it seems that there is a kind of affinity to, to eternity clauses because um, 13 out of the 22 members of the Arab League uh, do have eternity clauses. Now, what is the essence? What is the core essence of eternity clauses uh, um, as a concept? So you have the constitution making power. And the constitution making power creates the constitution with various institutions in it. And the constitution making power stands outside of the constitution, creates the constitution. And so by that idea, you distinguish between the constituent power and those institutions that had been created by the constituent power. And now the eternity clause comes in where the constituent power tells you that the constitution can only operate in certain limits that cannot be surpassed even by the authority of amending the constitution that is given to the constituted powers. Okay, so the constituted powers, once the constitution is in operation, the constituted powers might amend the constitution, but the limitations to what extent they can be, it can be amended, is set by the constitution making powers. So what the constitution making power actually really is, this remains a debate we cannot uh, address here. So this, blue arrow just tells us that that is the limit here. The, the, the constituted power cannot uh, uh, go beyond and outside uh, uh, what had been said. So eternal and immutable are those clauses only from the perspective of the constituted powers. Now, why does that help? It helps because it's a kind of clear limitations. So it's rather easy, especially if it comes to presidential term limits, which is more or less a binary option. Can I stay or do I have to go? It is quite, quite easy to provide a protection shield also for other constituted powers within the system like courts to help uh, um, other institutions accountable. And as a disrespect of the immutable clauses would be considered a constitutional coup d'etat. And some regions in, uh, in Africa do have an organization like ECOWAS that include constitutional coup d'etats as coups. So there is a zero tolerance uh, for power obtained or maintained by unconstitutional behavior. So now this approach had been criticized quite a bit by many because it is perceived as anti-democratic. But as Tom has uh, said previously, I mean, you can consider it as uh, anti-democratic from one perspective, you also can say it's rather a kind of pre-commitment by the constitution making power that in most cases are the people who wanted to pre-commit themselves. And there is a kind of Greek methodology, uh, the Ulysse and the Sirenes, that in order to prevent something down the road, you take precautions before. And actually, let's do not be too intellectual going to the Greek mythology. The easiest saying is Peter went sober imposes chains on Peter when drunk. And so coming back to the 
U, U.S. American context for a second, I think we can see how some of the chains are still working in the in the United States uh, uh, when when persons or some persons are starting to get drunk. So now on top uh, this claim that that would be undemocratic is only a kind of superficial argument because a study from uh, Rentians shows that those countries that have imposed term limits in general score much higher, significantly higher in their democratic performance. So if you commit yourself to a regular change uh, uh, of the rulers, it, it fosters uh, uh, democracy, uh, according to this, to this work. So now, uh, when in the kind of fourth wave of constitution making in Africa, after the Arab Spring, uh, the drafting of the constitution started, uh, people in those four countries had some experiences. And it might come not as a surprise that all four constitutions, or at least uh, the, the most recent drafts, include presidential term limits in the eternity clauses. Formulated differently, but they have it all. Interestingly, and this is now my excursus again, all the five hereditary monarchies that having immutable clauses from the Arab countries included this form of government as immutable. Now, did it work? Well, the problem with this concept of eternity clauses is, as I have said, that they are eternal only from the perspective of the constituted powers, but not from the perspective of the constituent power. And now again, what I have said is that predominantly uh, eternity clauses can be found in the civil law culture. So, and the most visible and present civil law colonizer had been France. So now in France, uh, the idea of having a new republic, I mean, we are in the fifth republic right now, but during the elections campaign, Macron uh, announced a sixth republic. So what does it mean? It means that occasionally <coughs> the constitution making power just drafts a completely new constitution and then is no longer bound uh, by the limitations set in the previous constitution. And since previous constitutions often do not tell you how they can be replaced, but only how they can be amended, you have a wide choice of opportunities to do that. And now the, 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 the schizophrenic, schizophrenic moment is that in constitution making processes, you often end with a referendum. So constitutions are accepted by a referendum. Tunisia is an exception. Uh, South Africa is an exception, but by and large, you have referenda at the end of a constitution making process as the so felt strongest form of approval. Now, also with regard to constitutional amendments, there is an increasing number of approving amendments by referenda. So, and the referenda, they are very much the same. So this logic of having the people once as a constitution-making power, as a, as a constituent power, and the same people 
in the same exercise as the constituted powers. This is difficult to, to explain and to convince people. And now what is very interesting is that actually the, the French Constitutional Council doesn't buy that concept, doesn't buy this schizophrenia. They say, well, come on. If the people decide by referendum, we as a Constitutional Council do not question whether the people have done it constitutionally. So we won't look at that case. Now, and this is actually what then had been copied by uh, Congo Brazzaville in, in 2015. You had this put provision, Article 185. You started a new uh, uh, constitution and here it is, the constitutional document, a new constitution of 2015 approved uh, um, and being in place, getting rid of the immutable clause of the eternity clause. Now, the problem is, since, since there is no pre-definition of how to get a new constitution in place, occasionally, it is easier ending eternity than amending the constitution. If you compare it with other countries like uh, what is required in Ghana just to amend the provision on presidential term limits. So now what can you do about it? And if we, we just have listened to Nathan and, and when he was saying there are constitutional moments, and I mean, normally constitutional moments are those moments where something new emerges. So now in a way of using or misusing uh, the, the process of drafting a new constitution just to get your term limits provision out of the way can be considered as a kind of uh, abusive uh, approach. And actually there had been courts in Africa who highlighted this. The Constitutional Court uh, in Niger and the Constitutional Court in Benin. Of course, there also had been other, and because they were saying, well, an, a president, a constituted power, cannot call for the Constituent Assembly. So even if the Constitution is silent, it cannot be by the constituted power, uh, especially the president itself. And, and the court in uh, Niger even said, well, he sweared his oath on the constitution and now trying to replace that constitution is a violation of, of his oath. Now, coming to the end, um, actually what we can see and what I have explained in the previous slides was the strategical approach how to deal with eternity clauses. So an easier way out was found in Egypt in 2019, because also in Egypt you have an eternity clause and they might say, well, you cannot amend this certain provision. And they say, well, amending means adding. But what we did is we created an entire new article. So I don't understand how otherwise they wanted to be kept in line with uh, Article 226. But this is what they have done. And actually, of course, there had been a lot of manifestations, a lot of protests um, and the highest administrative court just followed the French approach. And that's- Forgive uh, me, Marcus. Uh, yes. I need you to conclude we're, we're past the time limit. Yes. And this Thank is exactly my last slide. This is uh, the, the pronouncement of the highest administrative court. The people is a source of all power who can either reject or accept the amendments. Thank you so much. And thanks for reminding me. So Thank you so much, and apologies for that. I think, again, it's a fascinating uh, uh, exposure to some rather complex concept. 
if we were to think about it uh, in, a, in a more uh, simplistic way, uh, if constitution is a contract between the ruled and the rulers, and if a constitution as a contract can be improved with experience, then the ability to it to be amended should really be built into it, should be there uh, to allow it to be amended with experience and so on. But of course, it's not as simple as that. And there are limitations. There are also ways in which it can be exploited and manipulated for other gains. We'll come to all of this in the discussion. Thank you very much, Marcus. And now we'll move on to our uh, third and final speaker for this session. Uh, we have with, with us uh, William Elliot uh, Balmer. Elliot Balmer is a professor at the University of Dundee in Scotland, United Kingdom. And he has his work focuses on the policy oriented analysis of constitutional design choices project. And uh, his work focuses uh, especially on the idea of comparing uh, those constitutions that have um, derived from the Westminster Constitution and uh, trying to draw lessons from those. He, is, uh, he teaches uh, politics and uh, political thought in a number of Scottish universities, including Glasgow, Stirling, and west of uh, Scotland. Uh, William will now uh, share with us his experience on, based on a comparative uh, case studies. Uh, the floor is yours now. William. Okay. Um, can you hear me all right, first of all? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, yes, I, I make environment, but for the last seven years, I've been mainly working at International IDEA, the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, um, which Marcus also knows well, as do many other people here. Um, so my my presentation is really focusing on the role, not so much of comparative case studies, but the role of comparative knowledge in constitution building. What does it mean to be the um, the, the comparative knowledge provider in a constitution building process? So it's it's very much a, a personal reflection based on those seven years of experience and some of the things that perhaps I've, I've learned along the way. Um, I'm not going to focus particularly on the Arab world because I have not been, although I have a background in the Arab world, I have not been closely involved in constitution making processes very much in the Arab world, a little bit in Egypt, but we were kept very much on the outside. So just a, a general approach to reflections on that practice. Um, so We'll just start by looking at what is comparative constitutional knowledge, and then some of the paradoxes of this idea of being the constitutional expert in the room. Um, a little bit about the different target audiences and how they're engaged with, and then the changing need for comparative constitutional knowledge. So what do I mean by comparative constitutional knowledge? There's a, a quote here. Um, that I found in an old book from the 1950s um, that I tried to reconstruct from memory. I couldn't actually find it. Um, but it said, if you study voting behavior in the United States or the United Kingdom, you're a sophologist. A sophologist is someone who studies voting behavior. But if you study voting behavior in France or Italy, you're a comparativist. So there's this idea that, you know, comparativists study what goes on in other countries, right? That, that there's something quite sort of, um, almost exotic about the work of, of comparison. And certainly that how it used to be seen. Um, but it can also be, particularly when it comes to constitutional scholarship, can also be seen as a rather sort of dull and arcane world, right? Because um, a lot of the time we're, we're studying how constitutions are made and what constitutions say. Um, and S. A. De Smith, who was one of the great constitutional scholars of the 1960s, described it as the bleakest form of scholastic aridity. Um, I don't think there's a, a sort of better self-criticism in, in many academic disciplines. Um, 
my former colleague, uh, Samit Bissaria, who's now at the UN, so that when you do constitution making, you've got to know you've got to know the smell of the spices in the market. So there's a there's a contrast that's set up here, which is is really kind of leading me into my first paradox, which is this tension between comparison and context. So on the one hand, we're comparing constitutions and trying to understand commonalities and differences between constitutions around the world. But on the other hand, we need to understand the, the particular context in which constitution making takes place. And there is an assumption behind this, which is that we can learn from other processes and we can learn from other constitutions, that there is a body of knowledge out there that is relevant because of the transferability, even if limited transferability, of um, constitutional knowledge between contexts. So we can take things that we learn in, in, in one country and we can somehow apply that knowledge to another country. And this is in some paradoxical contrast with this idea that, well, every country is still unique. Um, even countries that are very similar and have similar historical experiences are still unique in important ways. And there's, a, there's this other question here of, of, you know, if we become country specialists, if we become people who really do know the spices in the market in, in one country, do we then lose our comparative perspective? And how do we as constitutional scholars and constitutional advisors balance that um, tension between being keeping the broad comparative perspective and developing uh, a, a country specific or region specific expertise? The second paradox is that when you're involved in constitution building as a comparative knowledge provider, as the expert, you're actually often, in some ways, the least knowledgeable person in the room about the context you're working in. So um, everybody else, it's their country, right? They know what goes on. You don't. You're the outsider. You might think you do. You might have read about it. You might have, you know, tried to cram as much information as you can on the on the plane on the way there, but actually, you don't know. And so we have to advise very much from a position of prof profound ignorance. Um, but at the same time, because there is some value in that comparative knowledge, we have to ask, well, what are the knowledge gaps and the experience gaps? So these people that you're advising and working with might know their own country very well, but they don't know other countries. And other countries may have gone through similar experiences. Um, it may be the first time that they have gone through a constitution building process, whereas for you, it's you know the seventh process that you've been working on in the last three years or something. So there's, there's that tension there of being confident in the knowledge that you bring as a comparativist, but also being humble about the ignorance that you have as an outsider. The third thing, I noticed this particularly when I was working in Tuvalu in the South Pacific, um, is you know, constitutions are political bargains. We've talked about that. The constitutions come out of a, a political settlement, but they're also legal documents and they need to be sound and workable. And sometimes politicians will come up with proposals that it's just difficult to see how they will work as a constitutional text. Um, and then what do you as an advisor do? Do you try to sort of advise, warn and encourage? Um, do you take that as a sort of given decision and just try to make it work as best you can. If you're in a, a drafting role, do you bite your tongue? Um, and again, a lot of this will depend on the specific role that you have as a comparative knowledge provider um, and also the stage in the process, right? So as things go on, if you're asked to give commentary on a draft at a late stage in the process, well, there might not be a lot that, that you can, even if you flag it up as a, as a sort of drafting problem, you can't change the fundamental political bargain because that deal may already be done. Um, at an earlier stage, you might be able to say, okay, these are some of the things you can think about um, and prevent those difficulties from arising. The fourth paradox has also been touched upon. I, I, I found uh, Nathan's distinction between um, uh, uh, public and participatory constitution making very helpful here. Um, but the way I framed it is that legitimate constitutions are expressions of popular consent, but effective constitutions are expressions of elite consensus. And obviously a working constitution has to be both legitimate and effective. So at some point that uh, popular consent and elite consensus has to be married. 
Um, and there's the, then the challenge of how the comparative knowledge provider helps people to navigate this, particularly when the drivers of constitutional change perhaps claim to speak in the name of the people. So you'll hear things like, yes, but the people are behind this, or we've done some surveys and we show strong public support for this, and therefore we are justified in overruling the opposition. And uh, you know, at what point do you as an advisor say, well, actually, if you want this constitution to work, to be effective, um, you may need to build a broader basis of support than just majoritarian rule. And of course, then they be to ignore. On the other hand, there are sort of cozy elite packs that might leave out the people, and that causes legitimacy crises. Some other challenges arise from sort of kind of conflicting uh, imperatives. Uh, on the one hand, as a constitutional advisor bringing comparative constitutional knowledge, you, you're expected to be neutral, right? Your people have been, you've been brought in there um, into an environment perhaps divided between factions, interests, parties, religions, regions, whatever, and you're not supposed to take sides. Um, at the same time, you have to be non-prescriptive. That is, you're not there to solve the problem. It's, it's the country's problem. They will solve it. There will be a political decision. Um, you're there to provide knowledge and resources and information. Um, and you don't have the legitimacy or the mandate to try and prescribe. And it wouldn't work if you did. So you're, all, you're, you're not there as a decision maker, and yet you must maintain your neutrality. But at the same time, you probably are there as a defender of democratic principles. You're maybe representing uh, an international organization or some kind of um, NGO that has principles of its own, um, which may lead you to steer away from certain types of constitution building processes where you know that the, the outcome is, or the intention behind it is, is anti-democratic. Um, and again, there's this tension between being the independent outsider um, who, who maintains that objectivity, um, perhaps at the expense of facilitating anti-democratic change or authoritarian backsliding, versus standing on those democratic principles and being portrayed as you know, an agent of neo-colonialism or uh, somebody pursuing a global agenda because you work for an intergovernmental organization and those those kinds of things. Um, I think I've got time for a funny story there, right? So on one occasion, I was, I was, uh, I'd been working with the, the secretariat that had been established to advise parliament of a small country in the South Pacific on constitutional change. And, um, we had worked out a series of options based on public surveys, which were then to be presented to a group of MPs. When we did this, which was agreed, the prime minister then stood up and said, you know, you're just trying to impose your views on us and you're just trying to determine what we should do and we're a sovereign nation. And if we don't like it, we'll put you on a plane and send you home. Um, and, he was making a point and then he invited me to lunch afterwards and he said don't take offense it's just you understand that i have to do that and of course i did understand that he had to do that but these are some of the tensions where he has domestic political audiences and domestic political pressures that he needs to respond to and play to and he needs to be seen to be in the position of of command and control and he could only do that by by making this this point so just difficult things to navigate as an outsider. My, um, my, my sort of starting point is try not to be Sir Ivor Jennings. Uh, Sir Ivor Jennings was a, was a great constitutional advisor and scholar um, who was active in many constitution building processes around the world in the post-colonial era, um, but came, I think, very much with an assumption that the, a certain way of doing things was best and that it had to be replicated in a given context. Um, and that just, that just comes across as inappropriate, I think, now. People have a much greater sense of their own experience of, of running countries as independent states, a previous constitutional history. Um, and this idea that the constitutional expert is there to provide the answer is is no longer right okay so um again it comes back to that question of going in with with a certain degree of humility one also has to be very cautious of of 
who we're trying to reach. Um, you know, who is the who is the end user of a knowledge product or of constitutional advice, and that will depend on our role um, and our stage of uh, the stage of the process. Um, but I've just tried to identify a few of these, um, be familiar to most people. Um, the color coding is to put things in sort of vague groups, but it, they're not sort of strict. But you can see there, it, you may be working with government ministers or with civil servants or in some countries with the military. Um, the judiciary it may have a collective voice in these things. It, it's different in every context. But I think when, when I try and engage, I, I've started sort of mapping these things out for myself to try and say, what are the points of access? Who's relevant? Who are our, you know, um, who who are the stakeholders? And you obviously don't engage with them in the same way. So, um, if you're dealing with civil society, you may have workshops, you may have printed publications, but you may also rely on things like um, videos that people can download on the internet. Whereas for government ministers, you're probably looking at very targeted, very specific, very short briefings. Um, and I've included their you know, employer and donors who, who may also need to be sort of kept in the loop and have an interest in this, all acting as pressures on the, the comparative knowledge provider. Um, in a sense, there is no neutral knowledge, right? Ev ev everything that you say, it can be construed and misconstrued. And so you have to be very careful about the, the information that you choose, even just Sometimes providing options can be seen as interference, depending on the depending on the context. Um, I tried to list some of the sort of different roles. Again, these are not sort of strictly divided, but I, I have of experience tension between a constitutional advisor and a constitutional legal drafter, and how. You know, as an advisor, you perhaps have more strategic policy advisory role. And as a drafter, you're just trying to uh, sort of untie the knots. Um, uh, there's also this, you know, this idea of being a civic educator, right? So in some processes, your role is really working with civil society or potentially working with the media to help them to understand constitution making processes. In others, you're working very close to the centers of power. Um, and a lot of it is really out of the country. So um, a lot of being a constitutional comparative knowledge provider is about writing and producing booklets, handbooks, primers. Um, I mean, the, the, the practical guide to constitution building that, 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 that Marcus uh, was involved in is still the go-to guide, right? That's, that's still something that we take everywhere that we go. Um, and has really stood the test of time. But we've also looked at other sources and, and forms of knowledge that are either shorter or more accessible. Um, okay, so I'm now gonna come to, to the, the overcoming some of these par paradoxes. And I, oh, my internet connection is unstable. If I get cut off, I apologize. Um, so some ways of overcoming these paradoxes. The first is just simply to be the knowledge repository, right? To be the guy that can be asked questions. Um, so you sit back, you wait, you you wait for difficulties to arise and for, for people to come to you with questions and then you can say, ah, I've got a publication on that or I can give you an answer. Um, another is to be the storyteller. So for the people who are going through constitutional change, it may be the first time they've done this, but you can tell stories about what other people have done. You're not saying what, what they should do. You're not saying, anything about the country that you're actually working in that you are not knowledgeable about, but you can tell stories from places where you have worked or places that you do know about. And you can say what, what worked and what didn't work in those contexts. You can also be the question master. So you can, you can be the one that an idea comes up, something is put forward and you can say, ah, what happens if, and you're using your comparative knowledge there to, um, to help tease out, to help unpick uh, people's assumptions or people's misunderstandings, and just to help lead them through to making more informed and better choices. And you can be what I call a awkward title, but a menu extender, right? So people think they have a choice between two systems, 
But actually what you can bring as, as the comparative expert is a range of other options that may break deadlocks or may provide opportunities for compromise. The need for this kind of comparative knowledge has changed over the years. International Idea was founded in the 1990s, really on the back of the changes that took place in Central and Eastern Europe in 1989 and 1990 and democratization in South Africa. Um, and really, I think the primary target audience in mind then was this idea of the person who used to be a dissident and is now, you know, in government. So that, that could be, the, you know, maybe not Nelson Mandela, but one of Nelson Mandela's ministers, and maybe not, you know, Václav Havel, but maybe one of Václav Havel's ministers. And a lot of that was quite prescriptive because it was about meeting international standards, and that kind of work is still done by people like the Venice Commission. From 2001, there was an increasing focus on post-conflict state building in the global south. So the target audience shifts perhaps to the minister who used to be a warlord, right? Getting people from... Um, a form of power that rests upon force to a form of power that rests along some kind of agreed legitimacy. Then <clears throat> with the Arab Spring and the color revolutions, we, we suddenly sort of looked at the person in the street, the, the, the person in the crowd, the person in Midan Tahrir, the person in the internet cafe as a potential driver of constitutional change and therefore a target audience for um, comparative knowledge. I would argue that since 2016, with the rise of populism and authoritarian backsliding and certain democratic weaknesses in what used to be regarded as established and stable Western democracies, we need another shift of our target audience, perhaps, to include the global north and to include those um, once stable democracies. And of course, they've not had the experience of recent constitutional building or recent constitutional change. Um, so there's actually perhaps in some ways more need in the global north than there has been in the global south. So to conclude, there's still a role for comparative constitutional knowledge. Um, the one thing that I've learned perhaps in seven years of doing this is to go gently and walk humbly. And if in doubt, ask, don't tell. Um, and the final thought is that it is a two way process, that when it comes to constitutional comparative constitutional knowledge, it's no longer about the global north or established democracies telling the rest of the world how to run a country, which it might have been in the 1950s and 60s. It's very much learning from mutual experiences to, I think, regenerate and renew some of the constitutional innovation in the global north. So I'll, I'll end there. That's my time. I, I say again that this is just personal reflections. Um, and there are many other people here who've also done this. So I'm interested to hear in the discussion how their views may uh, fit with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elia. Thank you for this uh, personal reflection, but rather critical. And I suspect Marcus will have a lot to say, a lot of some about some of those issues as the uh, one of the uh, best known experts who have transferred knowledge from one context to the other. So we'll come back to that in a, in a minute later. Those of you, please, who would like to ask a question, I just remind you again, we have 15 minutes left. Those who are registered as panelists, you can raise your hand. And uh, I already am receiving uh, quite a few questions from the social media. Uh, so uh, before, while people are gathering their thoughts and raising their hands, may I come to the three of you with one question, please? And feel free to respond to it, uh, and, and any of you. Uh, we're increasing, increasingly working uh, in a context where understanding the context as such is not sufficient. You have to adapt and be flexible to work with a very fast changing context all the time. And we're working in, uh, in, in context where uh, the constitution relies, as you rightly pointed out, three of you, on a political settlement. But the political settlement itself is not perfect. It is designed around compromises uh, that are driven by the ultimate need to bring uh, peace or to try and stop a conflict from uh, developing any further in, in any one context. So the political summit is not, is not perfect. Then a reflection of that is going to be a constitution. Is there a way to build a constitution in stages? I mean, is, the, is, it, uh, is it possible to think of a constitution that can reflect 
the dynamics of the context as a country emerges from uh, uh, conflict, particularly identity-based conflicts that are, are the majority of the conflicts these days around us. So I don't know if uh, any of you would like to, to go, to have a go at, the, at trying to answer this. Maybe Natan. Um, I will try. <laughs> um, my short answer is yes, there are ways, I think, but none of them are guaranteed success. So let me put your question in terms of uh, what, uh, uh, you know, Mar uh, Marcus used the, ex the, the, the metaphor of Peter sober governing Peter drunk. Well, what if Peter is not sober? What if Peter is drunk at the time he's trying to write the Constitution? What if there is just so much uh, difficulty and division and passion within the political system that you that, that, that you can't do that? Can you can you have an extended process? Um, there are two devices that I know of that have been used. Um, I should say my other co-panelists have much broader comparative knowledge than than, than than I do. Most of mine is restricted to the Arab world. But one is a temporary constitution, and and that is an example that has sometimes been used. Um, essentially, you just agree on, so in the air world, these are often constitutional declarations, but some interim rules of the game that everybody can agree to. Um, those are not politically neutral, and often they have a way of insinuating themselves permanently in the political system. So it, so it is one possible solution. Another thing that was actually very interestingly used in some of the uh, post-1989 transitions was just go back to the old constitution. It, it, it may not be perfect, but what, but often what was wrong with it was the context in which it was operating. So what if Egyptians in 1971 had said, let's just keep the 19, excuse me, in 2011, said, we'll just keep the 1971 constitution. Um, that was, and, and we'll activate provisions that just have gone to sleep, that were in hibernation. Um, uh, Nasr Amin, uh, Egyptian um, legal activist once famously described the 1971 constitution as a joke that became serious, right? So, so what a, those, those are possibilities that some countries use. Uh, they're not magical solutions, but they are options. Uh, I, I go back to, uh, Elliot said, you know, you, sometimes you just put options on the table or, or expand the list of options. Those are two options that some countries have considered. Can, can I add to it? Elliot, are you with us? Sorry, my, my internet glitched for a moment. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I, I, would, I would agree with what's just been said. Said that uh, the other thing is, I this, and there's also a problem. On the one hand, I'm, very I'm afraid, Elliot, we can't, we can't hear you. Are inherently there's something wrong with the, we can't, we can't hear you. We'll come, uh, tr we'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, Marcus, would you like, do you have a, any comment on this issue? Well, I can rather only underline what you have said. And uh, if we look at the example of Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, where, where really peace had to come in the first place, and you had to compromise a lot on the content of the constitution uh, and the design options just to bring peace. So it's constitution making is never the best technical option achievable. Uh, whatever that might be, but the best compromise that that is on the table. And and so now to ask us, and there I'm just saying what, what Elliot meant with being humble, ask us what might be the best compromise uh, in a kind of abstract scenario, I, I can't tell you. I mean, we will see, we will see now in, in your kind in Doha what will happen with a with the Afghan society in that process uh, and and what kind of compromises has to be drawn and uh, especially and this is also a warning taking up again what Elliot said I mean there might be some compromises that especially in a western world are extremely uh, bitter to swallow but again as we have seen in in 
other contexts like Bosnia and Herzegovina, if we want to have peace in the first place, probably doesn't come without compromises. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go back to our panelists now. Uh, Marwa Fikri, if you can please come in and, and keep it uh, very concise. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. I, I would like to thank all the speakers for their uh, valuable presentation. And my question is directed to uh, Professor Brown. I understood from his um, uh, presentation that constitution uh, document uh, may not be a prerequisite for democratic transition or democracy. So my question is, uh, uh, based on your experience in the field, can a flawed uh, constitution lead in the long term to a more uh, rationalized uh, political system, I mean, rather than being the dependent variable, the constitution can actually be the driving force uh, for change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Natan, can I please take another question and then we'll come back just in case. Uh, Mortaz, Mortaz El Fijeri. Uh, thanks a lot for, for the insightful presentation and my question to Professor Natan Brown. Well, we have seen in the regions that constitution making process um, can become a dividing moment as well. Uh, and I think Egypt is a, an exemplar, uh, exemplary ex for, for model for, for this, how constitution making in a divided society uh, can be can raising a lot of uh, challenge and it can also uh, undermine the democratic transition itself. One issue here is how constitution makers can deal with hard questions, especially identity issues. One approach is to go through an open and general answers for this question and not to settle everything in the time of constitution making process. Because we have seen in Egypt that all actors wanted a detailed formulation, for example, for the state religion relationship, and there was no possibility for compromise. So is it the right approach to have more an incremental uh, uh, approach, like, like to make this hard question open and um, leave it for future interpretation and for political uh, dialogue, rather than solving you know, this identity question in the constitution making time? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take a third question from Abdel Karim Amenga. Abdel Karim Amenga. Yes. Hello, I have just like one question, maybe an interrogation to Dr. Marcus. To Dr. Marcus. In fact, uh, I, I have a question to what extent is really the meeting a difference between two legal systems provide really an explanation to introducing or not a new, a new article in the Constitution? Because if you speak in a pure uh, debate, uh, like term, the ideal type of uh, civil law is France, and in France itself didn't have a uh, term limit until 2003. Okay. Abdel Karim, Abdel Karim I'm, I'm very sorry we can't hear the question uh, rightly. Can you please type it in and send it in, okay. in, in the okay. Q&A? We'll come back to it. Thank you very much. We'll go back now to Nathan, if you could please start by answering those questions. Um, sure. Um, it's, uh, there, there's some uh, good questions here, and, and they focus immediately on the Arab world. I think they may vindicate uh, what uh, Elliot was saying, was that you know pe people are, who are facing constitutional questions will often very much look at their own own political context. So we've got questions that are, that are motivated from what has happened in the Arab world. Um, let me uh, take them in reverse order. Uh, Motaz's questions about like, maybe can, can you defer identity questions? Classically, actually, this was often the way it was done in effect by putting all that material in the preamble or in the early articles of the constitution. And in one sense, it is a positive sign that people are no longer satisfied with doing that. Um, that they really want to know that there is going to be some real meaning to these uh, to these general words. But that makes it very difficult to operate. 
at the same time, I would say, I would go back to what I said, the, the differences between, for instance, the three Egyptian constitutions, 71, 2012, and 2014, are not that big in this area. They're biggest in Article 219, which we don't have time to go into. But for the most part, the formula sort of stays the same. What, what there was was mistrust, I think, not in the constitutional text, so much as there was mistrust among political actors. And that actually brings me to the to to the the, the uh, second question about constitutions, sort of imperfect constitutions uh, working. I'll, I'll I'll bend the question a little bit to answer it in this way. I think what um, that happens all the time, right? That constitutions work in a way that was very different than the one that was intended, or they're answering questions that no that occurred to nobody at the time. A successful constitution is one, I think, in which after it begins operating, that begins to happen. People, start, political alliances change, political parties change, people's preferences change, new questions arise. And a sound constitution is therefore not one that gets everything perfect, but that persuades all political actors that going outside of the constitutional bargain or the constitutional settlement is has simply too high a cost. Um, it, 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 and, and that actually relates to some of the things that Marcus was talking about in his in his presentation, I think, about, what, about, uh, uh, um, about amendments and amendments that become, this is, these are my words and not his, so big that they really fundamentally alter the Constitution. A sound Constitution is one in which most political actors say, rather than disrupt this constitutional settlement, we will take short-term defeat on this particular issue. Um, and, and, and yes, that does happen all the time in long-lived uh, viable constitutions. It's not inevitable, but it, but it certainly does happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nathan. I have a, a question here to Marcus. It's a question about the issue of uh, legitimacy of the expert. I mean, we've heard some uh, sort of critical uh, reflection from Elliot on the role of the expert and so on. But this question is specifically talking about the legitimacy, who gives the expert legitimacy to come in and draft or work on a constitution? Is this an international legitimacy lent to an expert? Or does the expert get identified by the local parties uh, or are there any other way of doing it? Marcus. Well, this, this is a very difficult question because it allows for various perspectives of answers. So, so who is legitimate? What I try to do in order to increase my legitimacy is to look what goes wrong in my country, in Germany, and how we perceive in our discussions certain processes. And so if you just observe that from an ethnographic perspective, and then say, well, this is a strange behavior, but no one interferes telling us, well, besides the European Union, but we do it our own way. So now from where we take it, that other countries shouldn't do it exactly the same way because we feel somehow confident with how we are doing it. So, and to that extent, um, whenever it comes to, to, to fundamental rights issues, I hold the mirror to our own society. I, I tell my German colleagues, especially in the ministries, please look how some human rights involvements developed. Just let me give you one example. When my mother got married, she was a teacher. And in the district we she got married, there was a law. And the law was saying in the moment she got married, she has to abandon her profession as a teacher. And this law was only repealed in 1958. So what I'm just saying is that's the one individual kind of thing to be legitimate. The other issue is, if you are invited, and this goes very much back to what Elliot say, is saying, so, so um, don't put yourself in the forefront, but just wait uh, uh, what you can provide while being asked and not what you want to present. 
to happen. And this is a conflict actually because you are often paid by international institutions that have a clear agenda. And if you want to get funding for your doing things, you have to a certain extent follow that agenda. And this creates a kind of um, special challenge in this task of uh, simply being a supporter when asked, but not more, and complying to what is expected from other ends. Thank you very much, uh, Marcos, for this uh, uh, trans transparent uh, and, and answer. Very important. Uh, if uh, I if I can please um, go one more one last question. We're running out of time, but this is an important. It's a combination of, of a number of issues that have been raised in Arabic on the on the chat box, uh, and I would like to start maybe Elliot with it, with trying to respond to this, and then maybe and the others afterwards. Uh, in terms of contextualization, the reference here is to Islam and the Holy Quran. Some feel that the Holy Quran, in, in a sense, does uh, provide that framework of the relationship between people and their rulers. And to what extent uh, the Quran or Islam is being observed and uh, respected in the new constitution uh, making wave. Uh, is it just mentioned as a cornerstone where uh, law does not should not conflict with it, or does it actually? Do you dig into it to come up with 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 the uh, uh, framing of the ideas? And related to that, another question in, in relation to women and gender rights, uh, 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 gender related issue rights uh, in uh, modern Arab constitutions. So uh, maybe uh, Elliot, if you if you're with us. Yes, um, I mean, I, 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 I think um, Nathan might be better a place to ask the to, to answer the first question about the the role of Islam. Um, I think he was about to to he didn't talk about the particular provisions on that on the uh, Egyptian constitution, but maybe now would be a good time to because the different wording is it is it two one nine of, of, of that particular provision go into this in some detail, right? And I think um, he could answer that better than I could. Sorry to put you on the spot. It's okay, <laughs> not to, Nathan. Okay. I was hoping to avoid the question, right? Um, and going back actually to things that you have said, um, I'm neither Muslim nor Egyptian. So in a sense, you know, in that, in, in that way, I might answer a question about the effects of certain things. And what I would say is that prior to 2011, the various provisions didn't, didn't necessarily have an awful lot of legal effect. To me, uh, what I can do is maybe reframe the question in the way that uh, uh, Moatez suggested in, 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 in his earlier question. For those people who wish to see a political system that reflects certain religious values, certain religious teachings, certain religious strictures, in, in, in a society, the, the, in, in a sense, the relevant question is, what parts of that religious heritage, religious tradition, religious instructions do you think should be uh, 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 enforced through the regular political process? Through part, you know, if, if, if you want, for instance, laws conforming to the Islamic Sharia, do you want them passed by a parliament? Or do you want them outside, prior to, above the, the regular political process, even above the constitution? And deciding that, um, is is the is the difficult question, and what Egyptians were confronted, I think, after 2011, was a situation in which what used to be treated as pretty words um, suddenly looked like they were going to have real legal meaning, and they disagreed very very sharply um, uh, um, about that. The particular formula that was reached in 2012 was one that I think would have allowed political differences to, 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 to be played out eventually, but there just wasn't enough trust in the process. So the problem I think was, was less in the formula than in a political environment in which nobody trusted anybody else. So much. And, and if, I, if I jump back in there with some comparative knowledge then, I mean, a, a good example of, 
of this is the Netherlands, right? So the Netherlands is a country that used to be politically divided over religion. There were there were two different branches of Christianity um, that 500, 400 years ago were fighting each other, still had a lot of distrust in the, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, as well as a strong secular component in society. Um, and they didn't try to find a constitutional solution to that in which the constitution would say, this is who we are, this is the, this is the dominant view that she's going to prevail. They tried to find a constitutional solution by using the constitution as a framework within which different subcultures could, could exist alongside each other. So if you want to be super religious, if you want to, uh, to, to live in a subculture of like religious schooling, um, religious newspapers, you can do that and you're free to do that. And if you want to be super secular, you can do that too. And the, the constitution didn't try to give ultimate victory to either of those interpretations. It simply tried to be a, a mechanism for taking what in the past had been physical conflict and making it into political compromise. Thank you very much, Alex. I'm afraid we've overrun uh, in terms of time by about six, seven minutes, but I'd like to give the last uh, word to Marcus uh, on this issue. Marcus does not want to speak, so I, fine. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I think we could have easily spent a couple of extra uh, hours on these very interesting uh, subjects. So thank you very much to Nathan Brown, Marcus uh, Bockenford, and uh, uh, Elliot Balmer for this very interesting presentation. Uh, we'll uh, now uh, hand over to our colleagues who are managing the sessions and hope to see you in the next session. Thank you very much.